Okay. So we're happy to have uh, Rahul Dalal from UC Berkeley, who will talk about statistics of automorphic representations through simplified trace formulas. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for organizing this conference. And uh, I guess thank you to everyone attending for um, taking the time to listen to me. So let's start. Okay, so first a uh, note on technical details. So this subject has a lot of details that will be distractions at the level of a 20 minute talk. So I tried to put some judgment in what things you should ignore if you're new to the subject. So if you see something in gray and you aren't familiar with automorphic representations, feel free to ignore that word. Um, anything that's an orange, I will try to explain, but I will not explain fully. I will explain it only intuitively and imprecisely. So I'll start with a sort of unmotivated definition of what an automorphic representation is, and then I'll go over some motivation for this definition. So let G be a reductive group over some number field F, a discrete automorphic representation for G is an irreducible sub-representation of this specific L2 space. So let's first go over um, a little bit about what all these words mean. So a reductive group, um, if you don't know what it is, you can think of it as a matrix group with nice representation theory. So that means that if you look at a finite dimensional representation, it'll factor as a direct sum of irreducibles um, and that all the root and weight theory that you learn about in maybe a Lie algebras class um, applies to the finite dimensional representations of the group. So some examples of uh, reductive groups, um, GLN, SLN, unitary groups, orthogonal groups, symplectic groups. And if you're not familiar with the full definition, I would uh, recommend that whenever I say reductive group G, you pick your favorite one of these and you substitute that in. So a classic non-example of a reductive group is the upper triangular matrices. So that has representations that don't factor as a direct sum of irreducibles. Okay, so what is this L2 space? Well, first of all, I should tell you what this uh, quotient is. So when I said reductive group, I said matrix group, but I didn't say what the elements of the matrix were allowed to be. So that's sort of the ring inside the parentheses. So GAF is matrices with elements that are um, Adele's over F. GF is matrices with elements that are in the number field F. So, and this, uh, this quotient, it's just the quotient. I just put it on the other side um, because for whatever reason, it's important to keep track of whether things are right actions or left actions in this subject. So what's L2? So L2 is square integral functions um, as a representation of the adelic points of this matrix group, the adelic matrices under right translation. So finally, discrete and sub-representation. So because I sort of cheated and I put the word discrete here, um, I can say sub-representation and that literally means sub-representation. Like it's a sub-vector space. In general, there's an analysis issue that this L2 space is an infinite dimensional representation. And um, those can be something called a direct integral of its constituents instead of a direct sum. So there is a definition of a non-discrete automorphic representation but then you have to put a lot of words dealing with this technicality and uh, that's maybe not necessary right now. Okay, so now that we have the definition of automorphic representation, let's go on to some motivation. So I'll quickly describe, like, um, talk about why people care about these things. So if you haven't seen this before, this definition might seem extremely bizarre, but the point is that these automorphic representations, they have a lot of handles to grab onto when you're studying them. You can throw a lot of the representation theory of algebraic groups at them. You can throw a lot of the representation theory of real groups and piadic groups at them also. In addition, because we're working with L2 functions, you can throw a lot of sort of abstract Fourier analysis to study them. So the key point is that they're nice to study, but they also mysteriously encode information about so much else that's important in mathematics. So for example, they tell you things about number theory, Galois representations through the Langlands conjectures. They tell you things about computer science, um, differential geometry, combinatorics, et cetera. 
Okay, so to help out with the, the intuition of what an automorphic representation is, let's go over the sort of simplest example. So if G equals GL2 over the rational numbers, then these automorphic representations should be something very familiar. So automorphic representations for G then sort of approximately correspond to new eigen modular or MOS forms. So if you haven't seen this before and you're trying to figure it out, I should warn that this is not very obvious. Uh, so the key step is that you can take this quotient of the adelic points of GL2 mod the rational points, and you can take a further quotient, and then you can get um, a, some a quotient of the upper half plane by some arithmetic subgroup. So then you can maybe sort of see how something having to do with functions on the adelic quotient could be something having to do with functions on this quotient of the upper half plane. So there's still a lot of representation theory work to do, and particularly the automorphic representation is a representation, and the modular form is a function. So you have to somehow take this thing that you're modding out by and use it to pick out a specific sort of one-dimensional subspace. But once you do all this work, you get this correspondence. So we've talked about what automorphic representations are, and we've given an example. So now let's talk about a first property. So sort of the first property that you might think about when you're setting automorphic representations is this flat decomposition. So if pi is an automorphic representation for a group G over F, then pi factors over places V of the number field F. So you can write pi as this tensor product of local components pi V, where each pi V is a representation of G of F V. So what do these components mean? Um, so I'll give the example for GL2 again. So pi infinity, the real component, sort of tells you about the qualitative type of pi. Um, for example, whether it's a modular form or a MOS form, what the weight of the form might be. Pi p, um, it's, it gives a little bit more information, but it relates to the p to the nth Fourier coefficients of pi. So if you sort of remember what you study when you're studying modular forms, this motivates a key question in the study of automorphic representations. So which combinations of pi v actually appear in this L2 space? So I can just pick a random representation of GFV for each v. I can tensor them all together, but that won't necessarily be something in the L2 space. The interesting part of automorphic representation theory is that this L, being in this L2 condition puts some complicated, mysterious conditions on what combinations of the pi v are actually legal. We've talked about automorphic representations now. Now let's talk about how to study them. So I'll focus on this specific key question here. Okay, so the first trick when you are um, decomposing representations, maybe what you learned in like a representations of finite groups class, the first trick is to look at traces. So assume for a moment that this L2 space actually decomposes as a direct sum. Then if you have some operator on the L2 space, the trace on the L2 space of the operator becomes the sum of the trace on each component of the operator. So what we want to do is we want to choose a clever operator. So this operator um, will pick some places pi v where we're putting conditions and uh, we'll make this operator be zero unless those conditions are satisfied at that pi v. And we're also gonna choose some test functions at pi w for other w. So this way you get a family of automorphic representations defined by these conditions on the pi v and you get information towards the key question. You figure out with these conditions on the pi v, what is the distribution of the components pi w? So maybe now you see why we might care about traces. Let's talk about how to actually compute these traces. So how do we compute these? Well, so first I'm gonna talk about sort of a beautiful fantasy world where everything works out nicely and it's reasonable to try to compute these. So we're gonna restrict ourselves to these convolution operators. So if we pick a compactly supported function on GAF, we can take this averaging or convolution operator of that function F. So what it does is it takes a vector V in our representation to an average of all the translates of V weighted by the function FG. So this is just a nice class of operators that are easy to construct and maybe more easy to study than something completely general. And all this integral is, it's just a fancy way of saying average. 
So if we're in our fantasy world where this quotient is compact, then you can compute that the trace over L2 of this convolution operator for F, after the slide, I'm going to sort of ignore the R and I'm just gonna write F and it's always gonna mean the convolution operator. The trace equals this specific formula over here. So this isn't too bad. Um, I think if you know how to take the trace of sort of an integral kernel operator and you assume that everything that needs to be unimodular is unimodular, so these quotients work out, um, then this is sort of a reasonably tricky, but it's kind of a fun exercise to try to derive this. So I want to focus on three pieces of this formula. So first, we have a sum over rational conjugacy classes. And that's the sum we're taking over. Second, what are each of our terms? Well, each of our terms are a product of two things. So the first thing is a volume. And this volume is of some sort of adelic quotient of a centralizer of the conjugacy class. So you can sort of think of this as maybe like a Tamagawa number or something like that. The second term is an integral over the conjugation orbit of that conjugacy class. So this is just a fancy way to write that integral. It's just a way to parameterize it. You parameterize it by um, cosets of the centralizer, right? So we call this thing an orbital integral and um, we're, we're gonna shorthand this by O gamma of F. So this is what happens in fantasy world. What happens in reality? So in reality, we don't always have compactness. So nothing converges when we're playing around with this expansion and doing all the little like Fubini steps that we need to derive it. So what we do is there are various truncations that we use instead. So each complicates both the spectral expansion I wrote down before, where the trace over the entire L2 space decomposes into the sum of traces over components, and this geometric expansion on the last slide with the sum over conjugacy classes, the volume terms, and the orbital integrals. So these truncations, they sort of lie on a spectrum going from the most basic coarse expansion all the way down to this completely mysterious conjectural beyond endoscopic expansion. So the things near the top of the spectrum, they're much more explicit. They're relatively elementary um, compared to the things lower down, but the terms in there have bad abstract properties. So when you're computing with them, things randomly become messy when they're supposed to be clean and it becomes, a, it becomes a little painful. Near the bottom of the spectrum, the terms are very inexplicit. And by that, I literally mean that they only exist by existence theorems a lot of the time. They're very complicated. It takes, instead of being elementary, where you can get to them in maybe like 30 pages, it takes like way, way more pages to actually develop these expansions. But the payoff is that the terms down here have very good abstract properties. So for example, the terms might actually be conjugation invariant, or if you go farther beyond that, you can get even better abstract properties. So the punchline for all of this that I care about for this talk here is that because of these good abstract properties, these formulas lower down, they simplify dramatically in special cases. So what's going on is that most of the things here, except for that blue, are extremely difficult to work with. But in the special cases, these lower down formulas become reasonable to think about. Which special case are we going to look at now? So we're going to look at the nicest qualitative type of automorphic representations. So I said that qualitative type has to do with the real component. So that we're going to the nicest qualitative type of automorphic representations will correspond to the nicest possible kind of representation of a real group. So for these kind of representations that we're looking at now, these are the discrete series representations that appear literally discreetly inside the L2 space on the real group. So these discrete series representations are classified into things called L packets. Um, for discrete series L packets, there's an explicit um, parametrization of the L packets, and there is also an explicit parametrization of the representations within the L packet. So let's go over the GL2 example again. So for GL2 over Q, the L packets are singletons parameterized by an integer greater than or equal to two. And if pi infinity is in the L packet parameterized by K, that means that pi is a holomorphic modular form of weight K. So looking at discrete series is sort of looking at the nice holomorphic modular forms, not the bizarre weight one things and not the mass forms. 
So the invariant trace formula specifically dramatically simplifies when we restrict to representations with discrete series at infinity. So now let me put up the specific simplification. So instead of looking at the sum of this uh, convolution operator over all automorphic representations, we're only going to look at the sum over discrete series representations where the infinity part is contained in some fixed L packet. Then there is this formula for what the sum of traces is. So don't worry about all the details of the formula. I just want to emphasize that it breaks up into the same sort of three parts as our beautiful fantasy compact quotient case. So we have a sort of sum over some kind of generalized conjugacy classes. And well, you may worry about this factor in the middle of the two sums, but that's some principle of inclusion exclusion thing going on. Then we have a literal volume term. Um, well, okay, yeah, a sort of volume term. And this is the same kind of volume term um, of a, a Dalek quotient of some centralizer. It just has some weird corrections at infinity. And then we have an orbital integral. And all we've done here is we've sort of factored the orbital integral into terms for the finite places, that's this phi gm, and then terms for the, the infinite places, which is this O. So now we have this nice thing for these particular families of automorphic representations where the discrete series at infinity is contained in a fixed L packet. So what's the point of all of this? So the point is that because we have this very simplified trace formula, even though we're working with pretty general reductive groups, um, well, not completely general, we need to ha actually have the existence of discrete series at infinity, then the terms in this formula can be sort of explicitly calculated. So I'm going to just list a bunch of names of sort of the, the techniques that you can use to calculate each part of this formula. And I'm going to give a reference of one place where you can find an example of how this happens. So the, these sums um, you can talk about with sort of like reductive group theory. You can sort of figure out how many terms in the sum are non-zero and you can sort of parameterize the terms in the sum a little bit. Uh, the phi term, um, this sort of comes from the vile character formula plus some root data combinatorics. This O gamma, this orbital integral, um, if you want to compute it explicitly, you can do it by counting points moved some amount under automorphisms of Bruhatit's buildings. Uh, so I should also mention that if you don't want to do it explicitly, you only want some kind of bound with ineffective constants. There's a really cool like model theory technique you can use called motivic integration to do this instead. But if you want an explicit computation, then maybe you actually have to go through this point counting. So this fm, this uh, function that you build off of f, um, it's defined by some explicit piadic integral that's reasonably, like it's easy to evaluate compared to the orbital integral. So you can try to attack that directly, but there are also some certain combinatorial formulas that you can use to do this. Finally, this term a gamma, uh, it has to do with the L functions of gross motives for reductive groups. We can compute all these terms ex explicitly. Now, what do we do with it? So remember, we're looking at families of automorphic representations, putting restrictions on some components. So because we restrict it to our special case, we're only looking at families where the infinite component restriction is that it's contained in some specific L packet. So because we can explicitly compute, we get good error bounds on statistics of uh, components of other components at these families. And these error bounds are good for lots of applications. So Shin Temple and 16, they proved um, something called Plancherel equidistribution, which is where you fix a component V and you, and you prove some kind of equidistribution law for the, uh, the finite component representations you get at that place V. They also proved something called automorphic sadotate, uh, which is where you take your pi V and you look at the pi V over lots of different Vs at the same time. And there's some sort of joint space that they fit into and you can prove equidistribution of all the components together. Finally, they were able to prove something about low-lying zeros of L functions corresponding to the automorphic representations in this family. Okay, so the next thing you can do is that, so we restrict it to families where the uh, infinite component was contained in some fixed L packet. Um, it turns out that if there's some trickery with the stable trace formula you can do, where instead of restricting to being contained in some fixed L packet, you can make the family a little finer where you can fix the infinite component inside the L packet. So you can look at families where the infinite component is some specific discrete series representation.
And you can prove the same kind of error bounds for shin template that should be good for the, all the same applications. So finally, um, there, there's some future things that you might be able to do. So in particular, these shin template type bounds, they had some exponents in them. So if you make those exponents explicit and you make them small enough, you should be able to prove these Sarnak Shue type bounds on the density of non-tempered components at a finite place inside this family. And there might be other things that you can do also, but um, I'm not sure what to, um, I, I don't know any right now. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, here are the references I put for further reading and uh, there's my contact information. And uh, I think that's uh, all I have. Great. Thank you. So let's uh, thank Rahul for his very nice talk. Let's wait for the applause to roll in. Uh, and so if there are any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the Q&A or raise your hand. Maybe while we're waiting, I'll use my privilege as organizer. Uh, could you go back to that theorem of Arthur? Yes. Uh, so could you tell me what a cuspidal reductive group is? Oh, so cuspidal is some, uh, it's, well, one thing it implies is that it implies, uh, okay, so let's see. I'm trying to think about the best way to explain this. Um, so it has to do with sort of the maximal split torus at the real components um, mm -hmm. being the same as the maximal split torus over the rational group. So uh, you can actually prove this uh, theorem. There's a version of this theorem that doesn't talk about, that works for a general group that has discrete series at infinity. Um, you just have, instead of talking about all automorphic representations, you have to talk about automorphic representations with a fixed central character, but that's a little more complicated to state. So I just stated the cuspidal version here. Okay. Great. Right. And there's a question in the Q&A from Will Salen. Uh, are there differences between your results and Shin Templier other than that you work with a single representation and not an L packet? Yeah, so um, there's, well, okay, so the main result is actually this thing that I just talked about now, that the Shin Templier result, um, I guess uh, it works for, well, part of it the, only works for groups with trivial center. So um, because uh, when you do the stable trace formula, you end up having to look at other groups beyond the group that you just started with. Um, that restriction is really annoying and it, it gets in the way. So the result that I have, it works for a general group that has discrete series at infinity. Great. And are there any further questions? Okay, so let's thank uh, Rahul again.